so thank you, Sigrid. Uh, my name is Marcus Borg. I'm with RISE Research Institutes of Sweden, as you have heard already. Uh, I'm going to address safety in this talk again. We have already heard quite a bit uh, uh, related to safety today. I'm going to talk about safety, especially for machine learning based or machine learning enabled systems today. And um, there is a lot of momentum at the moment in the automotive industry, as we all know. Uh, so a lot happened during the winter there from a standards perspective. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. And there is a lot for us to learn, even if we're not in automotive. And uh, actually, a lot of this is, is good common knowledge for the future, because how on earth are we going to make those autonomous cars safe? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So I start with a quote. Uh, a large portion of real-world problems have the property that it is significantly easier to collect the data than to explicitly write the program. So this is a quote by Andrei Kirpathy, director of AI at Tesla, one among uh, many prominent AI researchers at the moment. This was uh, a post he uh, had on, on Medium about a year and a half ago, I think. Uh, and it's an interesting quote, and it's something I will return to in, in this talk. So who am I then? I have a background as a developer with ABB. I worked uh, in process automation then, safety critical stuff. I was actually a compiler and editor engineer. Uh, and then I returned to the university to do uh, a PhD with uh, Lund University. I worked mostly on requirements engineering and software testing and the interplay between those two topics. Traceability and change impact analysis, quite a bit. I did work with Ericsson, as you heard Sigrid say, uh, already on bug assignment and trying to predict things in the inflow of bugs. And since 2015, I'm a senior researcher with RISE in Lund. And uh, today I'm going to talk about machine learning. And uh, you might have seen this XKCD strip before, this guy standing on a pile of data, stirring until the results look all right. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about functional safety, here represented by a green dinosaur explaining what rigorous means. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about SOTIF. And uh, how many of you have heard about SOTIF? Not many. Then, then you will learn things today, and that's, that's really cool. So this is what is supposed to, uh, to bridge those two uh, worlds. So machine learning and functional safety. So Kirpathy and his quote, he talks about software, the first generation of software, as humans writing source code and other humans being able to comprehend what this source code means. And possibly even the same human sometime later. I mean, it's uh, legacies and all that. We already heard about that. And then software 2.0 as humans instead creating the data and specifying the goals. And then you let the machine learning engines roll and you use today its back propagation and stochastic gradient descent uh, to produce millions and millions of weights in, in neural networks. But those weights do, uh, what they show is just how information is propagated from one side to the other in the network and humans cannot comprehend how this mapping is happening inside this very black box at the moment. But there is research on explainable AI as well. But uh, uh in general, it's very hard to, to understand what is happening there. So this means we are now working more with uh, uh, trained code rather than uh, or trained software rather than coded software. So less of the uh, source code on, on the right there and more of uh, uh, software that has been trained on huge data sets, annotated data sets where we say what things are, and then we let the machine find the patterns uh, and uh, this um, oh, it's slow. This has been tremendously successful in uh, certain domains where you have very specific problems and a lot of data. So especially annotated data, supervised learning is what drives a lot of machine learning in AI today. So for example, in, uh, in audio recognition, speech stuff, computer vision, machine translation, it has really revolutionized where we are today. But how does it work? I will uh, stay with the computer vision example. Uh, you have this network architecture, the black box, and then you start feeding it with data, annotate the data. In this case, 
images where you say what things are, for example. And then when you have a picture, you can feed it to the network. This is a picture I took from, uh, from the window of the University Library in Malmö this Monday. Uh, and there is a boat there. And then if you train this network for object recognition, then if you're lucky, you would get, hey, there is a boat over there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the idea. But uh, the, the, the mid part here is very black. It's hard to understand what's happening. And this is then uh, functional safety ISO 26262 uh, for the automotive industry, where everything is uh, uh, organized according to the V model. We've heard about that. Or actually, there are multiple Vs here. But requirements engineering, you know, you know what you're doing. You design, you implement, and then you test and verify on the right side. And um, there has been a new edition of this standard last year, end of last year, in, in December. And what, what happened there was they added motorcycles, so that's for you, Magnus, uh, buses and trucks to this uh, mix. Before it was only cars in this functional safety standard. And they also added a whole new part on semiconductor uh, development. So that's actually for Verifighter, our test mod partner working on ASIC verification. Good time for them. Uh, but this standard, it's basically some parts on management, some parts supporting processes on change management and uh, configuration management, and then a core, uh, core processes for requirements for the architecture design, verification, validation, and a whole lot of traceability throughout the system. And um, yeah, it's difficult to, uh, to do all this if you are uh, developing machine learning based systems. So we need something different because the definition of functional safety it is the absence of unreasonable risk due to hazards resulting from malfunctions of the electrical electronic system. So what we're talking about here is really bugs. But what if we now have this picture of a boat and we uh, feed it to the network and out comes, well, there is no object there. So this is not a bug, not at all, because this network did exactly what it was trained for. It delivered functionality according to its training. But still, this can, of course, be very dangerous, even without bugs. So this is from the Tesla crash uh, three years ago, almost now. And it was a big piece of news in, in media. And this is a statement from the Tesla team some weeks after, where they stated, Neither the autopilot nor the driver noticed the white side of the tractor trailer against the brightly lit sky. So there was uh, no real contrast here. This white uh, trailer truck turned left on this high-speed road and, and the Tesla just hit it. So it was very, very high actually, this, uh, this trailer. So the, the Tesla passed underneath it, but uh, um, yeah, there was a, a crash still and the dri driver died. He ended up... Uh, uh, crashing into a tree or something, I think. But anyway, it can for sure be super dangerous, even without bugs. So what do we do then? Here comes my guy with a the balloon then. Uh, what the uh, automotive industry, various partners in the automotive industry have been working on for a few years um, is uh, ISO PASS 21448, SOTIF. So here comes the, the new word for you to learn today. It's safety of the intended functionality. And this was published in, uh, in January this year, actually. I, I have it here. Um, it's uh, roughly 50 pages. Uh, it still costs you like 1,000 euros. Uh, it's published by ISO. Um, but it's a very interesting uh, uh, document to read. But, uh, okay, let's wait for that. Uh, what it tries to do is <coughs> it describes, among other things, the in inability of function to correctly comprehend situation, and this also includes functions that use machine learning. So this uh, standard, it's um, explicitly mentioning machine learning on the first page, and this is, of course, what makes it very, very interesting. But I, I lied, it's not a standard, actually. It's a pass. It's a publicly available specification. And that is something uh, ISO uses as a stepping stone towards a future standard. 
So uh, it's a response to an urgent need in industry to, to have a new standard for uh, autonomous cars, basically. <coughs> and the way it works, it now has to turn into a standard within six years or be withdrawn. So this is the first uh, edition of this uh, pass now uh, that has been circulating for a few weeks. And uh, what we need to know now, when it comes to automotive software safety, we need to uh, distinguish between absence of unreasonable risk due to malfunctions of the EE system, and that's functional safety, that's the dinosaur part, the ISO 26262, that's our bugs, and then functional insufficiencies, and that's SOTIF, and that's the new uh, pass, or uh, hopefully to become a standard. Two different things. Um, what the uh, SOTIF document uh, also prescribes is a process for how to uh, make sure the risks involved here are reasonable. And uh, I will now look into that uh, and show you how it, what it looks like. And I will try to focus on the test automation parts here. But there is uh, a lot of interesting stuff here, actually. Uh, this is one thing. It is not organized according to the V model. So this is a first big, uh, uh, big difference. It's actually supposed to be a complementary standard. It's not uh, replacing uh, the existing uh, functional safety standard. It, it complements it. Uh, but it's instil instead organized into four areas here. Uh, you have the concept of knowns, unknowns, safes, and unsafes. So the big four here represents the unknown safe states, so you're safe there, you, you don't know why, uh, you're not aware of it, and the document doesn't care much about that, actually. And then you have the known safe states, that's number one. And then you have the known unsafe states, that's number two. And then you have the unknown unsafe states, and that's number three, and that's the really nasty area. And what the goal of this SOTIF process is, then, is to minimize the unsafe areas, and actually the standard doesn't care about the unknown safe areas, it just disregards it. Uh, but how do we do this? This is of course uh, the million dollar question. And there is no silver bullet. Uh, there is hard systematic engineering risk management happening here. We have hazard identification to move things from unknown unsafe to known unsafe and then hazard mitigation to move from uh, the known unsafes to the known safes. And to do that, you will have to do uh, introduce like new safety mechanisms, uh, restrict functionality perhaps, and there will be safety requirements, and that's something that we of course need to test. And then the standard also talks about validation uh, to uh, or to find arguments why it's uh, uh, not a too big area of unknown unsafes uh, here in the, in the red part. I will now draw a flow chart here uh, explaining the uh, SOTIF process. Everything starts with the uh, requirements, specs, and then we have a block of risk analysis uh, where we then move from unknown unsafes to known unsafes. So as soon as we identify a hazard here, then it's no longer unknown. So that's uh, interesting. And then the risk analysis is split into two parts. We start by looking at the consequences. And if we come up with, well, there is no real risk for harm here, then we just put it among the OK risks, the safe, uh, known safes. If the consequences are not OK, then we look at the causes, the triggers, what causes this to happen, what is the driver controllability here, what is the, uh, uh, the likelihood that it would happen. And if uh, it is too likely and not controllable, then you need to return and update your requirements. And this can then uh, iterate for, for some time. And I would say, as testers, we need to be part of this also to make sure whatever comes out here from the requirements part is something we can verify later. Because uh, we now have safety mechanisms that move from known unsafes to known safes. And when that has been... Uh, completed to a reasonable degree, then we start with the verification part. And uh, it's split into verification and validation in, in the SOTIF document. So the verification is for the known unsafes, and that's where the standard actually has some, uh, some um, recommendations for how to do this. 
it splits those uh, advanced functions into uh, three parts, the, the sensor systems, the uh, uh, decision algorithms, so that's our, our machine learning, and then also the actuators. And for each of these three, there are uh, recommendations for what might be a good testing method, verification method. So for example, for sensors, requirements-based testing for range and precision, uh, inject inputs that trigger hazards. And then for the, uh, the machine learning part, this is where it gets more interesting. But there <coughs> is still a lot of research to do there. I will return to that. The recommendations include robustness testing, randomized input testing, and uh, seal heal meal in the loop testing. We heard about that today already. It is recommended here now. Uh, and for actuators, for example, environment testing and uh, accelerated life testing, humid climates when it's really cold and things like that. Uh, so these are things we have tried, uh, tested and verified before, so not uh, that much new here. But when we look at the uh, test automation, of course, robustness testing, randomized input testing, in the loop testing, this is, of course, things that uh, uh, will have to be automated. And then we have a lot of integration testing that is needed here as well, and we must automate there as well. Uh, but if we <coughs> do this and we come up with, uh, come to this decision point here, can we verify our safety requirements? If we cannot, then return uh, to the planning then and uh, update your requirements and make sure you can test them, verify them. If it's okay, then we continue with the validation part. And uh, so TIFF has then recommendations for what to do there. This is all about evaluating the residual risk. So now we cannot pinpoint what are the hazards here, because if we could do that, it would no longer be unknown. Uh, so here the idea is to, um, to do in the loop testing, uh, randomized input, long-term vehicle tests and fleet tests. We could use those uh, Test beds we have uh, in Sweden, we have Asta Zero, for example, uh, for autonomous vehicles and other vehicles as well. Uh, test of corner cases, simulation, worst case uh, scenario analysis. And again, we will obviously uh, automate some parts here and hopefully more than that, but uh, these goes without saying. And uh, then you have again a decision point. Can we now conclude uh, that we have a reasonable risk in real life scenarios? Um, how much evidence have we managed to gather here? If we haven't, then we need to return and do things over again. If, uh, if we uh, think it's <laughs> all right here, then we can start preparing the release. And there is a small release checklist in, in the SOTIF document as well. Uh, but that's like the whole uh, idea here uh, of the SOTIF process, and this is how uh, we, from uh, a bird's eye perspective, uh, will have to make the uh, autonomous vehicles safe. Um, so I have a, a short conclusion here in the end. And um, uh, software, both 1.0 and 2.0, I want to mention both of these. Uh, together they drive the increased level of uh, automation in mobility. Uh, that's evident. It's not only the machine learning parts, that's a very small part uh, uh, of a car actually. Uh, but manual testing of increasingly automated vehicles, to me that sounds really, really strange. I mean, that's really oxymoronic almost. I mean, it's of course we need to, to automate our part in this um, as, as test engineers. Um, also, so TIFF is currently 95% informative and only 5%, even less probably, normative. So uh, it doesn't say how to do this, it says, it gives you some good advice on what you should think about, but it's an excellent opportunity now for test research projects like Stamp, Shift, Testomat and the Software Center activities to really influence and, uh, and uh, provide recommendations for what should be there. And uh, Software 2.0, this machine learning based data driven way of uh, looking at software, it of course requires some evolution of software testing and verification validation because uh, you need now to test perhaps also the training data, test the machine learning models, uh, you need to think about configuration management uh, a lot because you will have to manage your data, your labeling, your 
uh, your hardware you used when you actually trained stuff, and there will be so much to think about when it comes to uh, configuration management. But anyway, there will be many small steps required to reach SOTIF safety of the intended functionality. And test automation will, of course, be, be the backbone to get there. Thank you. <laughs>